Hi everyone and welcome to this week's summary lecture. I'm afraid we have quite a bit of material to cover and before you forget about it, um, there's good news, which is that I'm going to try to cram a lot in. I'd like to cover three chapters, which technically um, you were assigned to, although you were assigned one last week that I'm going to be covering and I'm going to cover the other two. It just, I, I'm, um, I'm trying very hard to make it so that you don't have too much to read each week, um, but at the same time we're covering content that fits together at the same time. So I'll be referencing some things that you may have read last week um, and then some things that you read this week. And um, all of this today is going to fit under the, um, I don't know, the, the, the umbrella of the four P's of marketing. And we're gonna be covering the first three, and the idea is, is that once we get these first three, once you feel like you have a, a good grasp of um, how to consider the first three P's of marketing, then you'll be able to do the fourth P, which is promotion. But next week, I'm not actually gonna have you submit anything because for the promotional part, which is talking about the types of materials you're gonna use, right? This is the communication part. Um, how are you gonna convey the message that kind of we've been talking about all semester, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of time to think about that. So just bear with me today. Let's get through the first three P's um, so that you can be thinking about which of the, how you want to address all of these different factors in your campaign. And then we'll set up you actually designing your promotional materials or at least um, proposing them. And you'll be able to do that um, over the course of a little bit more time than usual. So, um, okay. So, Three P's. <laughs> there are four P's. We're going to be talking about three. Um, the first P is product. Okay, so um, this is where you're going to be thinking about what is it that I'm actually trying to sell to the people that I'm um, tailoring this entire campaign for. And um, your book lays out three different types of products that you're going to need to think about. Um, the first is the core product. And really, this is probably why you chose the topic you're dealing with to begin with. The core product is really what you hope to accomplish. It's like, what is the benefit of doing the behavior that you're trying to recommend? Maybe you are doing a um, campaign that deals with trying to get um, you know, dogs adopted because you are concerned about <clears throat> all of the negative benefits of, um, you know, overpopulation of, of, of dogs and cats and, and um, pets that are being killed or potential pets that are being killed or um, maybe even, you know, the concern about people having pets in their home, you know, that um, need a good home. So um, I, the benefit of the behavior, of course, is really kind of um, the essence of why you think this is an important thing to begin with, okay? The core product, however, is that actual behavior. So different from, oh, now these animals will have a home who didn't already have a home. The product itself is the actual adoption, right? So the behavior that you're trying to get people to um, quote unquote sign up for or perform, okay? So that's the thing that you're actually trying to sell. And really the success of your campaign to some level is gonna be determined by this actual product, whether or not people actually went to the shelter and adopted more um, animals, okay? Um, and then finally, there are also augmented products which is kind of um, the term that we would use for any um, <laughs> any bonuses or um, any other things that people could get out of your campaign uh, that might actually encourage them to do that actual behavior, that core product. Um, I'm sorry, that um, actual product. So these would be um, different types of um, incentives, for instance. If um, let's say that you um, were going to um, give, oh, here's a good example. Um, I remember, I mean, this is, God, I don't know where this came from. I guess the animal thing, since we're talking about animals today. Um, I remember when we, uh, we first put our pets on like heart guard medication. It's like stuff so they don't get heartworms or something. You know, the, the boxes that have the medicine in it always have a sticker that can, um, be used to put on a calendar. This is back before I did everything on my iPhone, of course, but um, they would have a sticker that you put on your calendar to remind me to administer the medicine. So that's just another product, right, that isn't really the core product. It's really not the behavior they want me to do, which is just give the medicine or buy the medicine. Um, it's another little product that can help push me along for that goal, okay? Um, Think about how all these things would work with like another problem like um, we've talked about organ donation in here. So, okay, well, what's the um, what's the core product for organ donation? 
probably saving somebody's life, right? You know, um, the, the benefit of being an organ donor is that um, you have the opportunity to give somebody a, another chance at life, okay? Um, this includes live donation or um, post-hostimous or, uh, organ donation. What's the actual product? Signing up to be an organ donor. So there's that benefit, which is what you're hoping people will get out of it. But then there's the actual product, which in order for this to happen, they have to sign up to become an organ donor. They have to be on a registry. They have to um, put organ donation on their registry, or maybe they even have to talk to their family and have their family consent to um, donating organs uh, after, their, um, after their past or something like that. So that would be the actual product. Um, so then what's the augmented product? Well, it depends. Um, I know when I lived in Georgia, uh, and they just, shoot, I can't remember if they do this in West Virginia or not, but um, in Georgia, they actually give you a discount on your driver's license, right? Um, and by the way, I don't think anybody would argue that, you know, <laughs> somebody who is really opposed to becoming an organ donor would be given the opportunity to get a $5 discount and all of a sudden put aside all of their fears or anything else they're wrestling with and say, oh, well, $5 changes anything. No, of course not. But that discount, right, um, or that um, maybe they get like a little, um, I don't know, badge or indicator on their license. It, it's not necessarily the product itself. It's just something else that they can get that nudges them or pushes them along, okay? Um, so I want you to be thinking about all those different types of products in, ter in terms of your own campaign. And then, again, just to kind of put this in perspective, the reason we even care about this first P is because these are things that you're going to want to address in your promotion, right? These are all things that you're going to need to somehow um, distinguish between, but also clearly communicate uh, to give the audience that you're uh, talking to the, the appropriate direction. Um, okay. Um, and by the way, as always, I mean, I can, you know, I can say this till the cow comes home. Your book has a wealth of examples. In fact, I think they even did some of the ones that I did, like they did organ donations and they may have had slightly different um, products that they listed. I can't remember, but um, you can see all different types of examples in there, like um, the increase of increasing mammograms and um, obviously the, the, the benefit for that or the core product would be um, early detection and um, hopefully cure of breast cancer. Uh, the actual product would be the mammogram. So sometimes what I like about that example is you'll see the objective that you have, the behavioral objective, sometimes usually is the actual product. And then, you know, as for like um, different augmented products that you could offer, maybe some sort of, um, you know, uh, they had like the example of like, kind of like the actual, the dog medicine, uh, reminders that people could get or, or different things um, that people, cards or um, little things people can hang on their shower to remind them uh, after a certain period to go get the mammogram. Okay, sorry. You can read the examples for yourself. Um, sometimes I know it helps to hear it, even when I talk fast. Um, okay, um, P number one, check. P number two, price. Now, when we hear price, especially if we're talking about in a traditional marketing context, a lot of times we are talking about price in the most literal sense, right? We're talking about monetary price. We're talking about, okay, well, if we want people to buy this product, um, what's the appropriate price to get them to do this, right? We um, obviously um, don't want to price something too high or they won't do it. Um, they won't buy it, right? Okay. So this is act actually not too far from that because same thing in social marketing, monetary price is also a concern, but we're also concerned about non-monetary uh, prices uh, or costs, okay? In fact, your book lays out, let me just get to um, Basically, you have monetary incentives, like maybe somebody would actually benefit like by getting some money for doing something. Maybe they would get a rebate for performing a, a, a certain behavior. Maybe by starting their own garden, they're going to save a lot of money because uh, they won't have to go in the grocery store and buy expensive avocados. God, if anybody can teach me how to grow my own avocados, I would save so much money. Um, probably have to move to Mexico for that, but still. Um, the idea, though, is that there could actually be things like I, I in the example I gave you about the organ donor card, right? Um, if, if I become an organ donor on my driver's license, I save five dollars. That would be a monetary incentive. There are also, of course, monetary costs, which um, are uh, <laughs> things that um, actually hold on. Let, let me go back. Um, I don't want to phrase it monetary costs. Your book phrases it as um, 
monetary disincentives. So these are things that it's like, if you don't do it, you're going to lose money. Um, I mean, this is right. How the criticism that, um, Obamacare gets, right. There's, a, there is a monetary disincentive on not signing up for insurance, um, because you get fined. Uh, there's monetary disincentives. If, um, for instance, if you have a behavior, right, that's going to end up costing people more money than they normally do, this would actually disincentivize people's willingness to do something. If you're asking them to, um, for instance, purchase a product um, that they need, like let's say you want them to switch, let's say you want them to buy a Prius, I don't know, and they're like, oh, it's so great for the environment, but maybe Prius is like $10,000 more than what they would normally spend on a car. That would be a monetary disincentive. As far as um, price, though, there are also non-monetary disincentives. And this is not what your book says exactly, but this is something I want to say to hopefully help you out. Think about non-monetary disincentives and incentives as the same things we've been talking about all along in terms of benefits and barriers, right? As, as far as motivators and incentives, same thing here. So now we're not talking about money. We're talking about other things like psychological, um, psychological associations that might keep them from performing a, a certain behavior or fears, right? If they have fears about something, or it could be barriers, lack of access, um, or lack of knowledge, right? They don't know, um, how to sign up to become an organ donor. They don't know where to get a mammogram or maybe they can't afford it because they don't have health insurance or all these different things that, although, sorry, ha ha ha. I mean, I guess the, not, the, the health insurance thing would, could be a monetary thing. So, okay, scratch that, scratch that. But maybe they don't have a regular doctor. That would be another sort of barrier that I would also argue could be considered um, a potential price in that it could cost them something, right? Um, so I, I guess what I'm saying is, is if you go back and you look at the activities that we've been doing, go back and look at the discussions that we've had where we brainstormed about all the different types of incentives and barriers and things like that, I bet you'll be able to identify um, pretty easily some of these non-monetary incentives and disincentives that you already have. Um, and so your book... Um, basically suggests that what you need to do is start thinking about, okay, now that I've identified these things, what do I want to do with them? What's the best way to get people to do my behavior? You're going to, of course, have to determine which ones you think um, are the most pressing. And I should add that sometimes you're not going to be able to touch them, right? You, you might not have control over the DMV. <laughs> so even if you think it would be a great idea of, oh, let's, um, I don't know, give people Let's give, let's give, oh, here's an interesting idea. Um, let's give people $10 off their driver's license fee if they agree to lock their cell phone in their glove compartment. I don't know, before they, you know, get in the car so they won't text and drive. Okay, fine. Um, that's going to be hard to pull off, right? Because you don't always control the organizations that, um, th that make sort of the, the rules and, um, have the infrastructure that, that support these decisions. Um, I am willing to give you a lot of leeway. <laughs> You'll notice that, for instance, we are not going to be doing a campaign budget in this class even. And um, I don't mind you using your imagination so well, so long as it's within the realm of possibility. Like, I don't care if you imagine that you have lots of power and influence, so long as you understand how that power and influence is going to work. So I'm not so concerned about that yet. Um, it's something that you can consider, and maybe you want to um, eliminate certain um, costs that you don't want to have to deal with, or maybe... Uh, you don't think that mo like uh, monetary incentive is even something you want to do. But the point is, you identify those monetary incentives and disincentives, those non-monetary incentives and disincentives, and then you need to decide, okay, do I want to increase any of these? Or should my campaign, instead of focusing on increasing monetary incentives, should it instead focus on decreasing um, monetary, I mean, uh, decreasing monetary disincentives? Sorry, I'm just, in other words, um, Glasses half full, glasses half empty. What's going to be most effective for my audience? Will it be more helpful for me to give them money to do a certain behavior, or will it be more helpful for me to remove a cost that they're currently paying in order to do a certain behavior? Um, and again, that doesn't just apply to money. It applies to these more psychological or even geographic barriers. Um, and actually, this is a good way to segue into, um, into Chapter 12, 
which is the third P, which is place. And it is really, it's a pretty short chapter, um, if it's any consolation, um, which is place is something that's really tied in to these price issues quite a bit. Okay. Um, so a, a place is essentially where you want the people you're targeting to perform your behavior. And, um, as we've already talked about, I mean, I remember talking about this earlier in the semester when we, we, we were talking about um, how a barrier to um, healthy eating is, um, you know, lack of, you know, in, in lower income communities, lack of access to different types of um, produce, right? Maybe they don't have a, a real grocery store in their community. Um, so you've got this barrier. And if you're asking people to do things, right, you're going to have to think about, well, how, where am I going to ask them to do this, especially if they don't even have access to this resource um, near them? Am I going to actually have to create a place? Um, if you're trying to get um, dogs and cats adopted, right, maybe it's hard to lure people in to shelters to do this. Maybe you're going to have to send them to PetSmart around the corner and you're going to have to have... Um, some sort of uh, event or at least some sort of system set up where the dogs and cats can go there. Maybe it's online even, right? Maybe you don't want a geographic place, but the best place to advertise whatever behavior you're trying to get people to do is online. And maybe it's because of who your audience is, or maybe it's because, again, there's something holding them back. There's some sort of disincentive. Um, there's some sort of barrier that's making them hard to get to another place. Uh, some of you guys are thinking about doing things in schools, um, uh, recruiting people or, um, you know, uh, changing um, different elements of children's, uh, you know, school diet and things like that. And those are all good ideas. But when you start thinking about actually implementing all of your, you know, social marketing planning, you may decide that, well, I don't know, maybe the school, because... Um, I don't know, because parents um, don't have as much control there uh, or influence or because uh, teachers have, you know, limited uh, even influence or something um, that maybe uh, trying to get the behavior you're looking for in a different place could help you out. Right. Um, and again, these are all things that will affect um, not only how you think about uh, what your message is, but obviously where you put that message to. It's it's related to where you want to see people performing your behavior, but I also think it could be directly tied to where you want to advertise your behavior, right? It's really thinking about um, the, fe the feasibility of what you're asking for. Uh, the, <laughs> it's really thinking about how feasible what you're asking your audiences to do in a specific location. Um, and I think that, um, I think that actually covers it. I really, I mean, all of these summary lectures, I hope you get, I, I'm just trying to give you a really broad overview and I'm, I'm avoiding a lot of the nitty gritty. And on some level, I think that's really helpful, but, um, please do, you know, really take a look at what's in your chapters for much more detail than I can provide. Um, because I think it would be really helpful to solidify all of these thoughts you have about the priorities that you're going to have when you market, the things that you want to address or you think that your audience is really going to need addressed, um, and the things that might not be so important for one reason or another. And um, looking at the examples in your textbook, I think, could really help. Um, and of course, uh, we're going to be, you know, discussing this online, which is why I want us to sort of brainstorm the same way we did about barriers and benefits and things like that before, so that when you finally put this all together in a promotional package, um, you'll have sort of uh, crossed all your T's and dotted all your I's and, and things like that. So, um, okay, look forward to seeing you guys on the discussion board. Bye.